Carlton Bourne edits the news. Good evening, everybody. For months past, there has been a contest of wits between the President of the United States and the Washington reporters. They have sought to make him tell what he intends to do about a third term. He has sought, by banter, persiflage, clever answer, smiles, and occasional silence, not to tell him. How long can that battle of wits go on without somebody losing his temper? The president thus far has been unusually patient with respect to these persistent inquiries. Perhaps he feels that they are justified by public curiosity and public interest. But of course, as president, if he wanted to, he could have Steve Early tell the boys, now see here, no more questions about the third term or we'll cut out the press conferences. However, Franklin D. Roosevelt is clever enough with repartee and easy enough in almost any situation in relation to reporters to be able to continue to handle it. But he had to handle it again today, and it looks as though he would have to continue to handle it at every press conference that will come between now and the time that he makes up his mind to tell what he has already made up his mind about. Today, of course, it was what Mr. Lewis said yesterday that was called to his attention. After all, that was news that made headlines, that concerned him, that was a matter of legitimate inquiry, and the reporters didn't miss asking the question. His attention was called to what Mr. Lewis said, that he would be defeated ignominiously if he sought a third term. Today, the president addressed the reporter who asked the question rather sternly. He called him Mr. Bones. Mr. Bones is the end man in minstrelsy who sometimes asks and sometimes answers questions. And he said to him, give me one reason why I should comment on matters of this kind. The reporter, unfortunately, was silent. But he could have given a good reason. Perhaps the reporter hadn't heard about it. Because the good reason was contained in today's speech by Senator Burton K. Wheeler before the mine workers in Columbus, Ohio. Senator Wheeler says the president's silence on the third term issue is producing chaotic conditions and if continued may produce democratic disaster. Now, when a leading Democratic senator, who at the same time is a candidate for the Democratic nomination for president, predicts disaster for the Democratic Party, if something isn't done that he thinks ought to be done, why, of course, even Franklin D. Roosevelt would consider that a good reason why he should reply to a certain query. The longer the situation runs, said Senator Wheeler, the more chaotic conditions within the party become. It can only lead to disaster if the confusion continues up to the time of the convention. Of course, in fairness, we should add that naturally, Mr. Wheeler wants to know soon so that he knows where he stands because he has said that Mr. Roosevelt could have a third term nomination if he wanted it. And then he added any president of the United States can renominate himself if he wants to. The federal government has too large an organization and too much patronage for anyone to overcome it. It has always been true that a president could renominate himself and the government today is larger than at any time in history. Now, obviously, Mr. Roosevelt would reply that it is his silence that keeps things from becoming chaotic because of the host of candidates that would start fighting in the open immediately if he should announce that he was not a candidate. And of course, if confusion continues up to the time of the convention, well, that's something else. But it can't. The primary laws will require Franklin D. Roosevelt to make his declaration long before the conventions. What about March 4th, 1940, as a suitable date? for the president's declaration of intention. Then he's been in office seven years. It's a kind of an anniversary. He begins the final months of his administration. 
perhaps that's the time that he's picked. But can any president of the United States renominate himself? Is Senator Wheeler's statement completely true? Well, perhaps it's true to a certain extent so far as renomination is concerned, although even there he's got to have the support of his party and of his party leaders. And after all, unless they feel that he can be re-elected, even though he has passed out all kinds of favors, that isn't going to make them want to re-elect him unless they feel that he's a man who can be re-elected. So there's that qualification. And then when it comes to the third term, oh, that's an altogether different story. According to all the polls, a good half, yes, more than half, 55% of the people of the United States oppose the third term, even though a majority of those same people approve President Roosevelt and his administration. But Senator Wheeler has given the situation a strong push, and one wonders whether he has queered himself with the president. Senator Wheeler today said that definitely he doesn't like the third term president. And definitely, he likes what Franklin D. Roosevelt has done. And definitely, he would support him if he were renominated. So one wonders just where Senator Wheeler stands. He seems to be in a somewhat unhappy frame of mind. His speech today was definitely liberal and calculated to win the approval of organized labor and the unemployed. It agreed in practically all respects with New Deal policy, except for his emphasis on American isolation. It brought him a rising boat of confidence from the United Mine Workers. And so now, Senator Wheeler is definitely on his way as a candidate. And as I've said before, I've heard rather more about him than about certain other candidates who have been more frequently mentioned. Prime Minister Mackenzie King of Canada announced today that Canada's general election probably would be held on either March 18th or 26th. He dissolved Parliament at the end of yesterday's bitter partisan debate, as he had every right to do, and undoubtedly, from his point of view, it was good politics. There was a Liberal Party caucus today. The members endorsed the Prime Minister's action. Mr. King said there wasn't a single discordant note. There was the utmost enthusiasm and the greatest demonstration of loyalty any political leader ever received. Now, the opposition wants to form a national government. The Conservatives recorded their unqualified confidence in Dr. Mannion, their leader at a party caucus, and Mannion promised that if he is elected, there'll be a national government for which the very best brains obtainable among our people are drafted to serve in the cabinet. And he said that Prime Minister King was attempting a most unfair and unsportsmanlike trick in obtaining from the people of Canada a snap decision before they had the opportunity of being advised as to the weaknesses of Mr. King and his government and their unfitness to administer Canada's war effort. Well, one should think that almost two months would be plenty of time to tell everybody about whatever weaknesses the King government has that doesn't look like a snap decision. Two months of campaigning. It's wartime. And after all, elections perhaps have to be speeded a little in times like these. Dr. Mannion says that the present Canadian administration has been as incompetent in Canada's war effort as they were incompetent in times of peace. And then Mr. King promptly replied. He asks, where are the best brains of Canada? The people have a right to know who are the best minds in the country. He should give the names of this mysterious new ministry. And it looks, according to the anger of the Conservatives, as though they felt that Mr. King had done a smart political thing. President Roosevelt said today that Americans are free to volunteer for service in foreign armies without loss of citizenship, provided they take no oath of allegiance to the belligerent power. Obviously, that concerns those Americans who were reported this morning as having volunteered as aviators in Finland and who have reached Finland to serve. And what the president said today seems to contradict certain things that were said at the time that Americans left 
to serve in the armies of Spain. Now, the president points out that while foreign nations are prohibited from campaigning for enlistment in the United States, there is nothing in the law to prevent Americans from inquiring, for example, at the Finnish legation with regard to service with the Finnish army. Well, that sounds almost like a hint. But here's a question. Can such Americans go abroad without passports? Passports are now issued, we are told, only to those Americans who satisfy the State Department that they have an excellent reason to go abroad. Now, suppose two men applied to the State Department for a passport to go abroad, one to fight for Finland, one to fight for Germany. What would the State Department do? That's one of those questions that I don't propose to try and answer. Influential United States senators tonight are urging that we proceed cautiously with respect to what we do about Japan. The State Department is proceeding cautiously. The lapsing of the treaty is far more important to Japan than to us. We can reduce the sale of war materials to Japan step by step by the mere extension of the moral embargo. And this may be a more effective procedure than to apply a general embargo at once. Senator Hatch of New Mexico today said he is in favor of arming the State Department with authority to deal with both Japanese exports and imports. Such power would enable our State Department, the State Department, to control such imports from Japan as silk. And silk is Japan's largest single export. And the United States, and the United States is Japan's only silk customer. With such authority, we wouldn't need an embargo. We wouldn't need an embargo. Action by the State Department would suffice. Good night.